quite, a, um, quite an introduction, um, Marilyn Fordyce. I'm aware of the time, we're just running a little bit late, but um, we don't want to miss out on any of Stephen's uh, talk, so we might just run through till, we'll take a full hour, hey? I'm delighted, to, <laughs> I'm delighted to introduce Stephen Abraham, well known for his inspiring presentations about the big trends uh, in our profession. Stephen is a leading international librarian and lighthouse thinker in the North American library community with more than 25 years in libraries and the information industry. He's a frequent keynote speaker on issues that affect libraries, their communities and librarians. Stephen has been president of the Special Libraries Association, the Canadian Library Association and the Ontario Library Association and has earned many awards. In addition, he was named by Library Journal in 2002 as one of the key people influencing the future of libraries and librarianship. Since that time, Stephen has contributed in countless ways to the library and information world. He currently serves as the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships and Markets for Gale, a part of Cengage Learning, and thank you for their sponsorship and bringing him here. And today he'll be talking about his vision for the future of libraries. Thank you so much, Matt. Well, I'm honored to be invited back to Lianza. I love, this is my third trip to New Zealand, and it's just awesome. But now, I, this is the farthest south I have ever been in the world. Uh, and I was just n noting, as I was thinking about it, the farthest north I've ever been a little while ago was to Barrow, Alaska, where some people can see Russia from their porch, but I could see the North Pole. <laughs> And we do two things in common that far away. We both rub noses. And so this is a northern nose rubbing your southern nose. And the uh, honor to be here. I think it's uh, interesting to look at. My, 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 my wife's uh, grandfather's godfather was Robert Falcon Scott. So we have a bunch of Robert Falcon Scott's stuff in our uh, living room. And. Uh, I just, I didn't realize that he was big here too, <laughs> so I'm, I'm taking pictures in, in Christchurch of statues of him to take home so we can put them in frames next to it. Uh, and also I think we have another commonality between New Zealand and Canada in that we know how to put U's in words. We know it's Z, not Z, and it's center R-E, not E-R. There's just some right ways to do things. And I don't care if my company does all that publishing and spells it a different way. <laughs> There's cultural differences that are very important. So today I want to make sure that I show you the shades of gray in the debate that's happening and the way the world is changing. But also I'm hoping that you'll be equally pissed off and inspired. Because until we find the edges of where we think and value and have our passion for librarianship, we won't know what we're for. You can be against something all you want, it won't get you anywhere. You can be against a merger in a library. You can be against a reorganization of a library. But until you know what you're for, you're nothing. So what we know what we're for in libraries is freedom of expression, free access to information, a bunch of stuff that's very, very, very important to the progress of ourselves as human beings and the ability for our societies to self-actualize. So let's look at the kind of things that we can do right now. Who knows technology and service and content and information and sits at the confluence of all those things. We only get so many times in our lives to do great things. And right now, we are at one of those tipping points. We're at the edge of being able to do something great. We're also cute. <laughs> People don't always know what we're like. We have that wonderful female management style where we are uh, lovely, but we're sharks. <laughs> I learned very early in my profession never to underestimate a tiny woman. <laughs> You've met Penny, haven't you? Like, 
<laughs> no one would dare underestimate her. What would you attempt to do if you know you would not fail? And how many times do we limit ourselves by wondering if we're going to fail or not and giving ourselves, oh, let's study it to death? Or in library land, that includes, uh, let's have 16 committees instead of 15 because that'll reduce the failure rate, that'll reduce the risk. And, you know, oh, God, it drives me crazy. Why don't we just get rid of the failure thought and say, what does it take to win? Like in sports, like in the All Blacks, do they ever talk about failure? Unless they're learning how to win? And we've got these guys who drive me crazy. We've got librarians saying, oh, if only our databases worked like Google. Now, could we say a more moronic thing? <laughs> how many of you paid money to Google last month, last year? I'm not getting anybody. They made a billion dollars profit every 30 days for the last year. Your money meant nothing. <laughs> Who are they? Whose customer? Who's their customer? They're the largest advertising agency in the world. They are going to serve the needs of their customers. You aren't it. Your users aren't it. So why would we care whether it looks like Google? When I type in, you know, where was Ob President Obama born? Racist organizations have search engine optimized the results and paid money to make sure that lies are on the first three pages. How many of you would let my company uh, put advertising and search engine optimization fees into our databases to change the search engine results? Do you want your public databases to work like Google? We could really reduce the prices to you. <laughs> like, honest to Pete, if we keep the shallow thinking about Google, and transfer that shallow thinking to ebooks, because you know what's happening over the next five years. Anyone here doubt that the reason why ebooks are coming is so they put advertising in them? Contextually to what you're reading? You ready for that? So here we've got to protect our users, right? <laughs> we see our users coming down the slide, and who is the thin pink line between good research and bad research, a good experience, a bad experience, a commercialized experience, or a third way. There's nothing wrong with Google. I'm not anti-Google. I think it answers who, what, where, when questions really, really well and references dead. I think it does horrible jobs at how and why questions. We don't need to be telling people, like, you know, where's the local restaurants? GPS and Google can tell us where the best pizza place is nearby in my maps or whatever. But if I ask how to do a marketing plan, for my small business, I'm going to get four pages of search engine results that have been search engine option I paid for on consultants I can hire to do that. I'm not going to get an OPAC search or a database search that has good articles on how to write a search engine. I can do it myself. If I ask, uh, for instance, I inject uh, lizard spit every morning. And uh, lizards only eat four times a year, Gila monsters. And so we harvest their spit from their uh, mouths. <laughs> clean it up a little bit, and it helps diabetics like me uh, deal with the insulin problem that if they can eat four times a year, they must be able to deal with their insulin really well. And so it's got a wonderful effect in that it causes site-specific weight loss. So I lost 20 pounds between my hip bone and my rib cage. Like, you know, for a middle-aged man, this is heaven. <laughs> two, like, two tricks for all the middle-aged men in the audience. Get the triaglutide, the lizard spit, inject in your gut, you'll lose your gut, and wear a velvet jacket and women will touch you again. <laughs> and I want Derek's shirt because I don't like to iron either. <laughs> so when we're looking at search, if you type into Google lizard spit and diabetes, you have this information literacy skills to know whether that story is true or not. You type in cancer and peach pits. You have the, le le the, uh, the ability to tell the difference between a, a true story and a not true story. I'll tell you, hint, hint. the lizard spit and diabetes is true. The, the peach pits and cancer is a false story. What are we going to do in a society where I could search engine optimize the results to get a huge market of diabetics to use some false thing or a huge market of people with cancer to do something different? What will society be if we fail? I'm more afraid of us failing by not doing something than anyone else, probably. 
see this picture, what's wrong with it? Too much text. It's a problem with librarians, too. Now that we know from the Human Genome Project that we inherit our learning styles, information only becomes learning, only becomes knowledge through a process called learning. There are seven styles of learning. There's a group of genes that we inherit that creates our matrix of learning styles. So we found the genes for dysfunctions in reading. We found the genes for math and for music. If you have children, you see those genes being fluoresced from their grandparents or, their, or your parents. It's a fascinating thing. I probably can make a pretty good guess that 80% of you has to have text-based learning as your primary learning style. And we try to make everyone act like us. We are a minority learning style. So we've been through this shift once before when we went from scrolls to the codex in the book. You know, we solved a problem. Like, you know, an 800-page book on a scroll is a pain in the ass. <laughs> so we used pages and found out, oh, we can get in the middle of the book. Great, we can start where we left off instead of rolling it up every night. Now we're at a point of what compromises did we make for the book? And how do we get beyond those compromises? The book was a compromise. Like is, when we make a textbook, we're investing $150 million in reinventing the textbook. 95% of the textbooks in the world come from three companies, and my company's one of them. How do you reinvent the textbook? What, is, is the textbook a great format? No, it sucks. It's not a good format. We had to make compromises. And so how do you build a, a new container for pedagogy? How do you scaffold learning? How do you put marks in it? How do you tell if your students have read the article? How do you let them journal so the whole class can see it? How do you build peer support? What's the difference in that book than the one that we made the compromises on? So we look at our users, and too many of us see our users as their reading behaviors rather than their real goals. What are their real goals? Oftentimes we teach them information literacy, which is, I go into libraries and they have signs up, information literacy course, because we, we are so bad at marketing. <laughs> like, please admit you're illiterate and we'll fix you. <laughs> I often think, gee, if librarians were cosmeticians, they'd have beauty, they'd have ugly salons instead of beauty salons. Just admit you're ugly and we'll make you beautiful. <laughs> but you know, you go into the beauty salon because your goal is to be beautiful. What is the goal of the person reading in context? What are their success factors? What do they value? What is in their heart? What is in their passion? And how do we support that? Because very rarely is it about the book. And what is the reading experience? And what's the reading experience in context? I have far too many of us are protecting books and not protecting reading. Far too many of us think the book is at risk when there's no evidence to that. More books are being published, more books are being read, more books are being sold, more books are being circulated, more books are coming out. Um, what are we protecting? There's nothing, no, not, nothing at risk. We are worried about the Franken book because we're sitting there saying, okay, I immerse myself in a book and we read these readers and then we say, gee, this is interesting. Like I've got my readers at home. I'm an iPad user, my wife's a Kobo user, we've got a Sony reader and a Nook. I won't use Amazon's Kindle because I despise the man. And any man who will unilaterally, because he made my device, even though I owned it, pull books off my device without telling me, I find that offensive. I still, I find it offensive on my iPad when, I, when I'm not allowed to put political applications on my iPad because Steve Jobs doesn't like it when criticize, people criticize each other. And I'm going, have you heard the word democracy, you moron? Like, you know, in a democratic state, we argue with each other. When he banned the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, satires and pulled them off the iPad and wouldn't let them be done in the iTunes store because satire is criticism and he wouldn't approve it. This is real problems. And I'm really worried that too many librarians are being silent on the issue of why should someone who owns a uh, patent to create a device have the right to tell us what we can read? or say it has to be in my format to go on the Kindle, or I get to, pr I get to approve what goes through onto the, onto the iPad. How many of you think your library should be allowed to do that? Why are we letting devices choose what we can read? Why are we being silent on it? So we look at the humans in the books and what they mean. We know that, uh, I saw stat, stat once, they did a study of uh, autobiographies, 
and found 85% of autobiographies had a positive story about the impact librarians had on people's lives when they're telling their own story. So we know we have a positive impact. I know with me, uh, I had to hide on the roof of my garage every evening with my newborn sister and my uh, three-year-old brother because there was an enormous amount of violence in my family. So we just got all the books out of the house and went up to the roof of the garage where uh, my mentally ill parent could not find us. And we just stayed up there until it got dark and she drank it off. So after that point, I said, well, I'm running out of books. So there I was with the double stroller, taking my brother and sister off to the library in East York, which was six blocks away. You shouldn't, as a uh, five-year-old, be allowed to do that. <laughs> but I did because it was the 50s and apparently we were safe. <laughs> as I walked by the Catholic Church and then the private school. <laughs> Luckily, we had enough of us there. Maybe they didn't want to go after us. So I went to my public library, and they saw me there every night. They looked after me. They saw what I was doing. They gave me the books. And we took the books home, went up to the garage roof, and read them to my siblings. And that's how we got totally into books. And the librarians made sure they were always recommending new books for us and telling us what we should do. And in grade nine, I met my best friend, Eddie. Uh, Eddie failed grade nine three times. He was in grade nine the second time when I was there the first time. Then he went stayed in grade nine when I went on to grade 10. The only people in school who never gave up on Eddie were the librarians. The teachers just sent the librarian and said, you're too stupid. Eddie got three patents in his life and invented whole new ways of doing things. The librarians never gave up. They showed him how to get the patents. You know, he committed suicide two weeks ago, which is why I'm upset about it because both Eddie and I met our uh, wives in grade nine. My wife is still with me. She puts up with an ADHD husband who travels a lot. <laughs> and Eddie's wife died six months ago of her third bout with breast cancer, and he couldn't live without her. It's one of the great love stories, but it's upsetting. But Eddie was able to go in the library club and find a way to be himself because the librarians did what they were supposed to do. They didn't care about getting him books. They cared about making sure he became a person a fully dimensionalized person. They saw the person in him, not the poor student. Uh, a couple of months ago, I found my grade 9 and 10 and 11 librarian after 40 years. And she saved my life because I stayed at school. The, high, the, the, the club, the library club, was my way of not having to go home. And she, she said, I never knew you had that problem. And I said, well, you saved my life. Well, I didn't know. <laughs> I was just doing what librarians do. And of course now she's a, a wonderful, wonderful person, still working as a librarian. <laughs> so, God, we never die. You ever read the library journal obits? <laughs> Everybody's 100, 105. We don't need crematoriums, we just turn to book dust. <laughs> we obviously led happy lives and really enjoy life and are different. But the librarians made me. And they made me not because of the book, they made me because of the experience of learning and the experience of growing up, and the experience of developing. I know that, like, you know, as, as I took my mentally ill mother to New York last week, my wife, who has coached me for 50 years, uh, showed me how to spend a week with my mother in New York and uh, know that I was safe again. And so I'm like, okay, I'm 56, and I finally self-actualized. But it took three librarians to coach me through that for me to do that, because they kept getting books and articles and saying, how do you grow up, even if you're 56? So it's me in the world of information. If we look at the real person inside all of our users and don't see them as a borrower's card, don't see them as a user, like the only people who should see people as users are the pushers in the playground, see them as full people and what do they mean and what do they do. It's not about books. It's about the experience of immersing yourself in something. When you're in a fiction book and you're on an e-reader or in a book, it doesn't matter because the experience happens in your imagination. It doesn't matter because you're into end-to-end -end reading of text. The e-readers work great for fiction. And they're totally horrible at nonfiction. It's back to the scroll. If you're in an e-reader, try opening the book in the middle or getting to the chapter you want. Try looking at, oh, uh, well, my life's an open book. I just told you, right? <laughs> but will you watch your users on how they read? What are they doing? What's the environment? When we look at an e-reader where it's reflected light instead of a monitor, well, these are glowing monitors, but remember the days when we had cathode ray tubes and bright light shone in our face? And the flame wars that were on the internet because we were Nazis saying, I want you to tell me what you're doing, is shining a bright light in their face and it kicks in your flight or flight response. 
Then we've got plasma screens that glow, that just up your blood pressure a little bit and make you action-oriented. Or reflected light, a million years of human uh, evolution, where our, the rods and cones in our eyes need to see reflected light. It creates a comfortable environment, and then you go into your imagination when you're in a fiction book. Nonfiction, where you're having to take action, make a decision, extract something, put it into something, it's a little bit different on the, on the reader. Now we look at Google Books and the Google Scholar Agreement and all that stuff. So what's the thing that's going to happen with Google Books? Have, how many of you heard of Google Editions? A few of you? Okay, so you know Google has signed the top 40,000 publishers in the world at the Frankfurt Book Fair over the last four years, and it's releasing 15,000 of all those publishers' front list in the next couple of weeks. They've coded all those books to the chapter and paragraph level. So in fiction, it's one thing. Nonfiction is another thing. You've all gone through the evolution where you don't care about end-to-end -end experiences in magazines, except for a current fashion issue or people or something like that. When you're doing research, you get down to the article level stuff. You don't sit there and say, oh, please tell me what article. I must know what article was in front of or behind that in the issue. Your bound periodical collections are there for last copy rules but they're really just to provide nice, quiet, acoustic, low-lighting low places for students to go and have sex and not be interrupted because <laughs> who's going to go to the, to the, to the uh, bound periodical collection? It's just, it's not there for that anymore. They go to the databases, they pull out millions and millions of articles and say, okay, now I've gone to an article-level universe. I'm getting article-level responses. In the next five to ten years, when all the books are online, and they will be all online, because they've all been signed up and they're all being coded. And, you and you've coded everything to the chapter and paragraph level. For those of you who are playing with Google Scholar, you know they're integrating chapters of books and nonfiction with the articles and the MP3 files and the YouTube videos. What does an answer look like when I'm an experience-based learner or a visual learner and I see a video of something at the same time as I see an article or a page? Many of you work with scholarly publishing and, and people who need to get tenure, so they get five of their buddies together, write six chapters, and smoosh it together as a book and to meet their tenure needs. Do what, those articles make any difference? And then we put three subject headings on 17 chapters. And then we got full text, when that goes full text and we can find all those chapters individually, what's the difference between them and an article? When we move into an environment where there's a database versus a book. And are we ready for that shift? It's going to happen very quickly, and we won't even notice most of it. But the coding of the chapter and paragraph level of books is going to shift our behaviors on what we provide to people. And libraries that are organized around format are missing the point. That's what Federated Search and all the, some things like Summon and, Endeavor and all this stuff are, at the, are hitting grade two or three. They're doing pretty good. But there are two or three, <laughs> not fully grown up yet. And we don't know what it's going to look like. Open URL is working for uh, article level stuff, but it's not working for footnotes and books yet. But it will. So over the next three to five years, when those standards come out and it shifts, there's going to be a massive shift in our behaviors on how we pull content together. And when we ask people to ask a question, we're not going to say, oh, you need to go to a newspaper database or an article database or a book database or an audiobook database or an ebook thing it needs to be all in one place. And as long as we keep trying to teach them how to do stuff that was the right way in 1965, when they're growing up in the 21st century, it's not going to be in easy for us. I still love books. Books are great. But I think the book format works for certain things better. It works great for fiction. It works great for end-to-end -end reading. It works great when imagination is needed versus action. And right now, you know, last month we passed one billion dollars in ebook sales. Ebooks outsell uh, hard covers now, and sometime after Christmas, ebooks will outsell uh, soft covers as well. So we're looking at, and plus, I, th I, I have a prediction that we are going to have some wobbliness after Christmas when everybody gets their ebook reader for Christmas and goes on on. Do you have Boxing Day here? Yeah, everybody goes on on Boxing Day, and all the places crash. From our point of view as libraries, Whose needs are met by library management systems? When you go into a lovely, you're going to Harvey Norman and you say, I wanna, I'm going to go look for a new outfit. And you look around, you see stuff, you get inspired. I'm going to buy this. I might put this together, this different than the dummies wearing, or the mannequins wearing it. Do you sit there and say, oh, what I really want to do is just go look at their inventory management system. 
and type in red sweater. And that's basically what we do with our OPAX, right? Here's our inventory management system. It meets all of our needs as librarians. We can circulate a book. We can get it back. All that stuff. But it's not doing what they need. If we, did, if we knew that 50% of our users who were coming into any North American library system in a public library started at Amazon and then went to the library, what are we doing wrong? So you look at, uh, is it Auckland or Christchurch and uh, Yara Plenty that are putting in the BiblioCommons project to build locally positive reviews and book clubs and uh, commentary. And how many years have we been saying, let's, let's let the end users edit the mark record, and how many times do we hear screams of indignation coming out of the basement? <laughs> so when we look at the future of books, what is the future of books going to be if we support recreational reading and recommendations? I mean, some libraries where only the librarians are allowed to make recommendations, because apparently the opinion of an end user or an, another employee isn't good enough because they don't know how to do it. Like, how are we going to get respect for ourselves if we don't respect other people's opinions about their books? If we see our end users as just their books, we're not looking at the whole picture. And we can always find something to do <laughs> with, with the old books. So what's really happening in libraries? Where is all this change taking us? Do people still value the book? What's next? And what's the next role for libraries and information professionals? We've come through a period of enormously slow change. The last 20 years has arguably been the period when almost nothing happened. It just happened to happen to my generation, the whiniest generation in history. <laughs> oh my God, my phone got smaller and I had to learn to double click. <laughs> like, give me a break. You go into my grandparents where they got telephone, telegraph, two world wars, the depression, uh, airplanes, television, telephone, like a lot in the space of the, about 20 years. And they, damn it, weren't as whiny as some of my peers. <laughs> they invented a new world, they went through a massive shift, and that shift was a move from an industrial scientific to a financially driven economy. That depression was the uh, economic shift. They had to invent the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Exchange Act, Stock Exchange Rules, uh, the Williams Act, all that sort of stuff to stabilize the financially driven economy. Now we're in another economic shift, whatever you want to call it. And that economic shift is a transition from a financially driven economy where the MBAs and the CPAs and the chartered accountants ruled into an information and knowledge based economy. Who should be playing their cards right to do well in this next economy? What is the, like who are the largest donors to the political campaigns now in elections? The top 10 donors to the Obama and McCain campaigns were the top 10 copyright owners in the world. Nine of the top 10 weren't even American. Only one of them was American, Disney. What is, like when Obama went on his world tour this year to India and China and every single he's talking trade. Do you think he's talking trade in car parts? He's talking trade in economic and intellectual rights. And this is the shift that's happening. This is why ACTA is so important. It's why we're seeing secret, if you've been following the blogs, you know that there's a lot of secret stuff going on on uh, how, how information needs to transfer. The US government closed down 44 websites today. And they just have the Department of Homeland Security thing on them because they're worried about the WikiLeaks thing. They're playing whack-a-mole, but there's no way they're going to be able to cop it. But we need to remember that librarians play a vital role in building the critical connections between information, knowledge, and learning and that we understand how these things happen and what's happening in our space. The elephant in the room is that we don't always acknowledge who we are or have the confidence to say what we want. Apparently the big WikiLeaks thing is uh, it's the US diplomatic corps saying some nasty things about Angela Merkel in Germany, which, you know, it's just written documents going back and forth. And they say Canadians have a self-esteem problem. Woo, big surprise there. <laughs> we might turn it back on them and say, we think you have a bit of an ego problem. <laughs> but change can happen very fast. And that's what we're at the edge of right now, this tipping point. We've been through a period of very, very slow change, just like at the end of the 1800s and early 1900s, and they went into a period of very, very high, fast change. So now we're going into a period of very, very high, fast change. 
We've been through this period of slow change. If you couldn't handle the last 20 years, like if you've got the giant size bottle of KO pectate on your shelf because you're just nervous as anything, you're taking too many Valium, then you're going to have some issues. Uh, every once in a while, someone says, I don't need to worry, I'm retiring in less than five years. And I'm going, oh, please, just leave now because you're damaging <laughs> libraries. If you're not going to change. It's not about age, but if you've got like, you know, li librarians, you're going to live to 95, 100, and you're 60, 65 now. Do you think you're not going to change in the next 30 years? Like, go back 30 years. What was around 30 years ago? No ATMs, no internet, no email, nothing in any sort of grand scheme. No little phones. They were mash size phones. So we're, you're going to have to change anyway. So how do we adapt intelligently and how do we influence this shift? How do we make sure that the e-books aren't moved into a space where libraries aren't allowed to have them? How do we fight back against what we heard yesterday about the Publishers Association in the UK? You know it's just the UK. They're the only ones acting like morons on this right now. That sitting there saying, oh no, you've got to go in the library to download the book. And like, I hope Sillip, like, you know, the next day said, we're sorry, we think the Publishers Association are morons. Like, put out a press release. Where are our guts to say this is wrong in a, in a critically thinking, balanced society that somebody gets to do this? So we need to overcome some of the stuff in our field. A fear of leadership. The last survey we did of 20,000 librarians, 85% of them said they do not seek supervisory or managerial positions. <laughs> Talk about not getting it. Anti-partner and anti-collaboration. The last time we got a major global cooperative was 1972 with OCLC. When was the next one? There wasn't one. The myth we tell ourselves that we have huge collaboratives when half of our consortia are just elegant buying groups. Oh, we, we got a 2% discount. Yeah, but are you sharing servers? Are you sharing theories? Are you doing it on national scale? Luckily in Canada we've been doing some interesting advocacy work so we managed to get 500 million dollars out of the government to buy every scientific technical medical database for every university in Canada. Then we got another 180 million dollars to buy all the humanities databases and we got 40 million dollars to build uh, uh, local history collections. We got 50 million dollars in Ontario to make sure we knitted Ontario together better. But we started talking to prime ministers and premiers. We stopped talking to bureaucrats. We distrust size and we distrust for profit. So like, I work for a company where we have 700 librarians on staff. We may be for profit, but we're probably one of the largest employers of librarians. In my last company, we had over 300 librarians on staff at Cersei Dynex. We have a culture of victimization. Oh, they're doing it to us again. <laughs> You're only a victim if you think you are. We're introverted. 70% of librarians, according to the studies, are introverts. And 70% of human populations are extroverts. So we're the opposite of our people. Doesn't mean introverts can't do enormously great work. In fact, most of the great successful people in the world are introverts because they take time to plan ahead instead of, like me, stuff pouring out of my mouth without me thinking about it. <laughs> we are unsophisticated communicators sometimes. Well, I sent my annual report to the department head. Or we, talk, or we uh, send written documents to politicians. How many people here, hands up, think politicians read? <laughs> <laughs> They, of course, read, but what's their dominant style? Intrapersonal, oral. If you want to get their attention, you talk to them. More importantly, you get people they know to talk to them that they trust. You surround them. Or fatalism, the, the future happens to us. We don't create it. I fall strongly on the side that we can create the future we want. But only if we believe that. So we need to choose to be a victim of the changes that are happening to us, or to create the future we need and take collective responsibility for how we're going to get there. Especially in small countries that are sleeping with elephants. In Canada, we sleep with the United States. You know, we can keep her under control because we got 50% of the world's oil, which, you know, is the gotcha that keeps the little country going. But, you know, our kids are ranked one, two, and three in the world on math, science, and English testing scores, while the United States is ranking 70th. So we invest in education and we do stuff. But, of course, they, they, their military protects us. We're, like, we've got three machine guns in a canoe. Like, it's, not, <laughs> it's not, not exactly like we're going to be able to protect ourselves that well. There's two more machine guns than New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> it's just saying, I, I got, we got two more machine guns than you do. We got, <laughs> we've got a bigger coast. <laughs> uh, 
so part of it is as you listen to yourself talk or your peers or whatever talk, are they, is there, are they phrasing it as an excuse? We can't do that because we don't have enough money. Or are they phrasing it as a reason? Or we would need more money to do that. Or we would need more collaboration because when you phrase problems as reasons, you can develop strategies around them. When you phrase problems as excuses, you will instantly put your mind in the wrong framework to actually move forward. Just, these are U.S. maps, but I think they're important in that uh, can you say how many libraries provide access to job assistance? I bet you it's something like 100% in New Zealand, but you'll notice that parts of the U.S. it's not as high as it should be in a bad economy. You can also see the white ones. Those are the states that are practically bankrupt and the library couldn't afford to fill out their stores. Does your library have wireless? Does your library offer IT training to patrons? Does your library have e-books available to them? Does your library have staff who can assist how to use government e-government sites? And so this is one of the key things we've been using to sit there and say, reframe the way you talk to government. We have a couple of, uh, you might have heard of this party called the Tea Party in the US. And so when you have someone like that, you can't call them idiots to their faces, you, but you do have to work with them and find out what it is that they need. So you say, okay, you want to downsize government. Well, the best way to downsize government is to use a distribution network you've got in this state or this environment, and that's public libraries. Because it's not the post office. You need somewhere where they know how to help, have a service ethic, have the computers, how to make it work. And then you get the money to teach and train. I've been doing stuff on libraries where I, I would go into libraries for the last uh, two years and ask them what their top reference questions were. Never found one who knew. If you're in the question business, why don't we know enough about that? Pardon? Where's the toilet? Where's the toilet? <laughs> I ask for reference questions, not directional questions. You know, it's, it's one of those things like people say, well, I'm doing too much clerical work. And I go, you do realize that 40% of every CEO or president's day is in clerical work. But we have a dysfunctional idea of the clerical work we do or directional questions are an opportunity to uh, say to people, it's over there, buy the display on children's books. <laughs> So I went to Virginia, I've, I'm doing this in another five states now, of uh, what are the top reference questions, and like the number one question in Virginia was health and wellness. Number two was do it yourself, number three was genealogy, they're an older state. You know, it's, you know, always, you know genealogy is a nice target market to older people. Anybody here running a teen genealogy club? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, there's a certain point in our life where we want to find all the people who went before us, but it's usually not teenage. Legal questions, and so if you know, like we, we provide this for free to any library that wants it and build results on what do you have, how do you do it, and then you start to say well, strategically, the programs I'm gonna do, because if all the books are online and I can get them for 99 cents a chapter, or the, the algorithm that Google's developed for Google Editions is 80% of the cheapest price on the, any source on the web. So at $4 a gallon gas, how many people can get to their library and back just to borrow a book when I can download it to an iReader? So they can get their books for the stuff they want. So is the library about question improvement? Is cataloging about finding stuff for question improvement? What are the questions we get? And are, do we have enough to support a health and wellness program or a test prep program or homework help? So we asked, uh, do you have enough information or don't have enough information? Do you, what are the top areas of student homework support? We know that it's, it's for the K-12 librarians, they know that there's been over 150 studies showing that if you have a properly staffed school library, your standardized testing scores go up 20 to 25 points. So California closed down every school library after Proposition 13. Their standardized testing scores have dropped 30 points. The state is measurably stupider than it was 25 years ago. <laughs> They elected an action hero as governor <laughs> when those kids grew up. If you, have, if you have a partnership between a public library and a school library, the standardized testing scores go up an additional 5%. So when your strategies are, how are you going to build a strategy around homework help if that's one of your top five reference questions? What does, in Chicago, we put a program in from 2.30 to 5 o'clock every day that a teacher in the library doing homework support. Because teachers are taught how not to answer a question. 
public librarians end up answering the question. Kid comes in, what's the population of China? Here's the answer, go. Kid know better, hasn't improved. Dumb way of serving them. The better way, where do you think you'd find the, the population of China, which all school librarians know how to do? Well, I already know it, I looked it up on Google, good. But I'm not allowed to use that because my teacher won't let me cite Google. <laughs> you know? Well, neither would my teacher. Where, well, where, where, where else would you look? Well, I know a better place is Wikipedia, but I'm not allowed to do that either. <laughs> you know, yep, yep, we weren't, allowed to incite, we weren't allowed to cite Encyclopedia Britannica, but let me show you a trick. Okay, go, go, to, go get it on Wikipedia. This is where Tra Tara Brabazon right now, who we, the last time I was here, we, I did those three speeches. We did the one where we interviewed all the millennials. Then she did hers, then I did mine on the future of technology, then she sat on my lap for the closing session. She's teaching Wikipedia to students now. And critical thinking skills, that's part of it. Because you gotta remember that it's a pretty good product. Like Encyclopedia Britannica has 800,000 articles in English on it, and Wikipedia has 18 million. So which person is gonna give up 17.2 uh, million pieces of piece articles and the, and the multilingual aspects of it? So you take them to Wikipedia and say, okay, what do you see there? Well, I'm not allowed to cite this. I said, shh, shh we won't, don't tell your teacher. Go down to the bottom of the record. What do you see there? I see the footnotes. Do any of those footnotes look like an authoritative source? Well, there's a CIA handbook there. <laughs> do you think the CIA handbook is an authoritative source? Yep. Okay, click on it. Cite that. And don't tell your teacher you found it from Wikipedia. Because she might be my age, and she never went to the last volume of Encyclopedia Britannica, looked up the footnotes, and went to the original source. If you do that 100 times a year with every student, are your kids in New Zealand going to be better prepared to compete against China and India? Because you're going to have to be smarter and more nimble, because they can throw an awful lot of people at it. areas of the world where they get questions. Of course, in uh, Middle East is really big in the US right now. They have, a, they have a couple of issues there. You might have read about them in the paper. Uh, and they also, a lot of the people, kids there, their parents are spies. <laughs> most, of the, most of the spies live in Virginia. Everybody, you can always tell them when a spy lives in your neighborhood because they, windows are black, which is illegal unless you have a special license. You know, people get it, are CIA employees. So you can't shoot at them when they're driving their car. And then they all go into buildings that have no names on them, that have underground parking, because so you, you can't be a spy and leave your car out where people can get at it. It's always such a secret. Apparently, Al-Qaeda hasn't figured that out yet. <laughs> what are the top hobbies in a library? So I did the top hobbies and found out that the hobbies of our patrons match the hobbies of our users. I mean, match the hobbies of our staff. So we probably have staff who know how to do programs on this. Interesting. And of course, the best part is recreational reading is number one. So what do your book clubs look like? That sort of stuff. We've surveyed 10,000 users a month at Gale across North America. We could, we could do this kind of thing here as well. We just haven't rolled it out worldwide. And said every 10th search on any of our databases, who was using it, when were they using it, what were they getting? And were they happy with the answer? Now look at the statistics you're collecting in your library and how many of them are effort and how many of them are impact. How much do you know? So we have a, a, a relationship with a company called 4C. It's like Foresight, only 4C, not 4C, which is what I thought it was when I first heard it. But we're trying to foresee what users will do. So we know that 27% of the users of our databases are 18, 59% are female which is different than the people you see walking into your library. 70% of foot tra traffic in libraries tends to be female, and yet it's 59% when it's online. That doesn't mean the online women are using it less. It means men are more likely to go online than go into the library. We did a bunch of research on that, and uh, my favorite quote is, I don't want that judgmental bitch on the circulation desk to find my library fine and embarrass me in public. <laughs> Apparently we wouldn't do that, but I think occasionally someone might, but that's the fear of middle-aged men, right? 29% are college students, 5% are professors, and 6% are teachers. And they use it in December, January, and April, August. I mean, December, December and January, and August and July in North America. Sort of totally aligns with when they're doing their lesson planning 
in organizing their courses. So it tells us where librarians should be actually targeting those people. And any given day, 35% of the users are in that database on the library website for the very first time. That shocked me. And how do you treat someone who's in your library for the first time when you see them for the first time? And they divulge that. What do you do when they're online for the first time? Your system could tell you that this is the first time they've used this barcode to go online. And you could deliver a message or a pop-up saying, welcome, nice to see you. Only 29% found the library databases from the website. That blew me away. So could you name where people are finding your website? Where people are finding your databases from? And who are your partners? And how well are you managing them? We know who they are if you want to ask me later. 59% found what they're looking for in the first search, and 30% more said, uh, we don't know yet, but we're on, on our way. That's a pretty good satisfaction number, that they're actually finding stuff. 72% trusted the content in the library more than they trusted Google, but they were still going to use Google. Well, why not? Like, you know, they start with Google. You all start with Google. Why on earth would we tell anyone not to do what we're doing? So sometimes we believe a lot of what's not true. So we know that the databases that are offered from libraries match any other experience on the web. They're just as good as uh, Amazon, bookstores, Barnes and Noble, um, government sites, everything. And yet as librarians with our critical thinking, we tend to divulge, diverge into uh, criticism and black hat thinking instead of knowing we're offering a pretty good product. Better product, actually. And we have this coming at us. And it's more than that. It's a bigger meteor. It's a hundred things coming at us. And that's going to be a challenge for us over the next couple of years. So as the technology advances, we hold the key. We should know how to change the construct of how people do research. The internet and technology have now progressed to their infancy. Anyone ever had a toddler? That's where they're at right now. And that's the one time, you know, when you have a toddler, you know you can adjust their behaviors. Anyone ever had a 13-year-old? <laughs> ever tried to adjust their behaviors that well? No, it's hard. So shift happens. We have an opportunity now at the edge to get things to a better place. And it's going to be awesome what we do. We know that people are changing. There's my daughter. You might guess that she's a little bit of an unusual person. She's a fashion designer. She does a bunch of stuff. There she is with blood running down her thing because she was doing Alternative Fashion Week in Toronto. Uh, you can't see the guys in the back, but she's big on body painting for guys wear, which I go as a female empowerment thing probably. <laughs> but she's, uh, this whole thing was vampire themed. There's my son, my wife, the master teacher of English, the best-selling author of 40 books, and him holding up his master's in English. Who do you think my wife, the teacher, author, and the husband, librarian, publisher, get along with best? <laughs> He's awesome. I, unbelievable. I can't believe what he does. Like, you know, look at how many people have kids who dress as W.B. Yeats for Halloween. <laughs> and she dresses like this all the time. <laughs> Every day is Halloween. When he's communicating with the written word, I get it. He's a beautiful writer. He's got a vocabulary. When she's communicating visually, she does a really, this is a bustier she built out of the, the old apple tree that was in our yard. <laughs> and tied it together with ribbons, looked pretty good. I think she looks pretty in it. And I said, that looks really uncomfortable. She says, Dad, have you ever seen high heels? Do you know what women will do for fashion? There's her wedding dress at the end of the Imago uh, Fashion Art Toronto thing. You will notice that it's black. These are long fingers, big uh, bat-like head, three-foot shoes, so they're very tall. And I said, Sydney, that's, you know, my wife and I founded Toronto's first feminist co-op. We worked very hard in the early 80s to get equal rights for women in the Canadian Constitution, a group of 60 of us. Then we got same-sex rights, same-sex marriage, and uh, equal rights for natives in Canada. And so we worked really hard for that. And so my daughter, who is post-feminist, designs this. <laughs> And I'm going, I'm not quite understanding it, hon. It's a little offensive. And she says, it's not offensive, Dad. Look closer. I said, I'm looking, looking, looking. I, say, I see a, a black wedding dress, Sid. She says, look at the groom. <laughs> and 
So, and then I realized, okay, you're the ironic generation. You're making a point. She goes, finally. <laughs> it didn't take me to all those art galleries for all those years not to get that. And so, you know, there she is in her uh, sustainable uh, non-fur bra. And so I bring, I bring up my own kids because I can use pictures of them because they're mine and they can't sue me if they want me to continue to pay for things. <laughs> but look at the range of people we're dealing with now. The range of learning styles. My son at one end, an incredible text-based learner. My daughter at the other end uh, has been teaching at the University of Toronto since she was 14. So she's got real talent, but could she get out of high school easy? No. So she's going through high school while she's teaching at U of T in uh, Olympic level gymnastics and dance, and she specializes in working with autistic kids because she's got really good interpersonal stuff. She's gotten mute, elective mutes to talk, so their parents love her. But it's her art thing. She sees visually things that I don't see because of who I am. And, she's, and so I've been able to learn to respect what she does, but I always don't always know what the hell she's doing. <laughs> Many of us see kids like this, the next generation. We see them from their reading behaviors. Does that, does that look like a kid, any kid you know? There's a couple of them around, and that's okay. They're part of the deal. But they're not like that. They're a broader range. Back when I went to university, 17% of high school graduates went on to university. Now 47% do. The universities are now challenged having this wider range of learning styles because they used to only choose the mathematical, logical, text-based learners. And now they get these lovely kids. My daughter goes up to the reference desk, she told me once, in the York University Library to get the graphic novels, because she's taking the graphic novels course. And the librarian goes, that crap's back there around the back wall. <laughs> so my daughter, being well-trained, said, aren't you supposed to be giving me good service? <laughs> <laughs> so we're looking at a world where these kids, when she was in high school, my son was on Facebook, she was on MySpace. She still has MySpace pages because she's got her rock bands that she manages touring Europe right now. They're on a development contract through the gay bars of Europe. Because until you've been through the gay bar thing, you can't prove that you actually can play music. And so, if you, <laughs> Kelly and the Kelly Girls is one of their bands, if you want to look them up. And uh, so she said, I just changed everybody in my high school over to Facebook. And I said, well, I said, she says, because you can control the perverts better on Facebook. So, I, so I'm, I'm learning from her on how to control my privacy settings based on, I don't want perverts. I'm constantly being friended by women who have more cleavage in their little photo than any librarian I know. <laughs> on their photo, not more cleavage. <laughs> and so she's changed them all over. And I said, how'd you do that? And she said, well, you know how girls, girls go to the washroom in pairs? And I said, yeah. And she goes, well, I told everybody in the washroom. I said, oh, that's so weird. You know, guys aren't allowed to talk in the washroom. <laughs> we just aren't. It's a rule. Look it up on YouTube. Look up male washroom etiquette. You'll get all the videos on how we're supposed to behave in a washroom. <laughs> so I said, well, how'd you get the boys to go? And she, she said, well, Dad, the boys go wherever the girls are. I don't have to tell them. <laughs> and so then Zachary went on to the, the University of Toronto for his university education, then uh, Concordia University in Montreal, and now he's doing his PhD at the University of Ottawa. She went on to York University, and she's got her dance clubs and her U of T classes and all that stuff attached to her Facebook thing. She has every friend she's ever been socially connected to, and every classmate she's ever cared about connected to her for life. Zachary can change cities three times. She can change cities any time. She's going to Cuba next week, and she'll meet her Cuban friends there. All that sort of stuff. What does it mean to have a socially connected generation for life? Where's the number one place people go for information when they have questions? Friends and colleagues. If you're not their friend or their colleague, how relevant are you to anything? So when I go onto your websites for your library, how many pictures will I see of staff? How many profiles will I see of staff of what you're good at? Or do you have what the Americans call the Canadian self-esteem problem and say, well, I'm not going to say I'm the best business researcher here. You've been doing it for 20 years. If you're not better than the users, you should quit. How do we build a profile that says we're good at what we do and say, I can confidently say I'm the best information literacy trainer and the best business researcher. I really do genealogy well. I'm a great book recommender. I tell stories to children and then connect to people. I even had someone in one of my speeches say, Stephen, I read stories to two and three year olds. Why the hell do I need Facebook? I said, do they, do they drive themselves to the library now? So. 
So she connected up with them, had to quadruple the number of storytelling hours she was giving because she was advertising to the moms who are the Facebook generation. So how do we get ourselves out there? We know that Twitter and Facebook are dominated by the middle age now. The gaming market, the largest market in the world, you get more revenue from gaming than books, periodicals, encyclopedias, and newspapers combined as a revenue source. Gaming is dominated by 30, 35-year-old women. I know because you're throwing your damn farm bill land at me saying, my cow's going to die, please feed it. And so those of you who are on Facebook know you get all the, the stuff, but it's okay, I'll block you. Uh, <laughs> social networks, fastest growing populations are seniors. It's more international, less urban, more English. Ebooks usage are mostly middle-aged people. The ebook readers are dominated by 40 to 50 year olds, which is a good, good thing, you know, because if you're like me, you have 12 of these because you lose two a week because I can't read normal print anymore. We know, we know that we've got next generation where their IQs are 15 to 20 points higher than the boomers. So we've had this massive increase in IQ over the last 30 years. Just because they got little Ferraris for brains doesn't mean they know how to drive them at 190 miles an hour. That's our job. And when you have this great increase in IQ, like there's reasons for it, right? They're the first generation that was no lead in the paint. So when they were chewing on their cribs, they were chewing lead-free paint. They were the first generation to grow up with lead-free gas, so they weren't breathing it. In the United States, the first generation to grow up with open abortions, so they were wanted, which increases your IQ. And they're the generation that grew up with video games, and video games uh, change the dynamics of your brain. More sulci, more gyri, your brain works faster. If you read the, what video games can teach us or everything bad is good for you, you can look into the challenges this generation provides to us in terms of the massive behavioral changes. The crime rate in North America is down 65%. Once the boomers got too old to crawl through a window, our kids are pretty good. <laughs> and there's still a 70% overlap with the boomers between the millennials and us. They're only 30% different. So there's lots in common with it. So if we watch them and see what's going on, have our students changed? Yeah, they did. Not that much, <laughs> but that much. Like if I go into my classes now, my classes look like this sort of lecture theater, and that's what it looks like. And I make them all friend me on Twitter and Facebook, and I watch the back channel where they say, Stephen looks a little fatter today, or something like that, because they're a little bit direct. Well, we had a bunch of boomer women who brought up their daughters to be very direct, because they had to unlearn politeness that their mothers made them too polite. So they were going to be damned if their daughters weren't direct. Polite, but not uh, subservient at all. Uh, the boys actually have a little more emotional intelligence because men my age have three words for emotion. Happy, mad, sad. That's it. <laughs> not, not much more beyond that. Whereas I go downstairs to my son and say, Zachary, what are you doing today? Oh, I'm feeling a tad on we. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> what, what does that mean? I have no idea. I've had years of therapy, and I don't, like, you know, middle-aged male therapy is teaching us a vocabulary to describe what it is about that we can't describe. We've got a world where discovery and ideas are changing. The future's changed. It just has. All universities have cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary, integrated in somewhere in their mission statement vision. There, you no longer have a science library as a good idea alongside a humanities library, and never the twain shall meet. If you're in a science library and you're not looking at the ethical literature that's over in the humanities library, if you're not connecting up, connecting the dots, you have problems. The Human Genome Project, the Animal Genome Project, Cow Genome, the Encyclopedia of Life with a web page for every single animal in the world, the Organization for Human Brain Mapping and Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging where we know where brains light up. I have a thousand kids, I MRI their brains. I know what their brains do when they're looking at my database. I know when they're forming verbs, I know what they're looking at. I have eye tracking software on them. Their eyes move differently than the boomers and the Gen Xers. Gen Xers, it's an F frame. Boomers, it's an A frame on print and an F frame on computers. And their eyes move in a circle and a dot. So if, if you're uncomfortable with some of the changes we make with our uh, databases that are for university and K-12 to students, it's okay because we didn't make it for you. We made it for their comfort level because they're the ones we need to make powerful. We're already half-baked, half fully-baked. We've been in space. There's a human ear growing in the back of a Harvard mouse. My friend's doing this. He's building uh, so he can put pancreases on the back of a pig and grow so he can make natural insulin. 
uh, the stuff we can do now is just incredible on stem cells and book digitization, everything. The interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary aspects of the world we're going to be in, when his people who are doing the cracking of the proteins that will allow human uh, pancreases to grow on the back of a pig will be interesting because he's got eight people who, are, who know how to do that in Harvard, in Edmonton, the Banting Best Institute in Toronto, in Israel, and Germany. That's where the diabetes researchers are who do that. They don't even share a common language. They do share a librarian. Got an iPhone? <laughs> Try putting that in your pocket. You know, we've dealt with change a lot. Some of us still have one of these in our library because we just quite haven't figured out how to get labels to come out of that laser printer. But <laughs> most of that's gone, right? You know, we're, you, we're, we're ready for the death of all these formats. Christine talked about it yesterday. The DVD format will be dead very quickly. We've already watched VHS and all that stuff go. Vinyl. We're going to see the same thing happen with books. Between Google editions, putting all the books out there, Google Books and all the old stuff, and the Google Book Vault, you notice the American Agreement, which will be the model for the rest of the world, gives one free computer access for every single university and public library in the world. Isn't that nice? And, it's, and it got ALA to calm down. I wish they'd read a little further when they found out they had no printing rights on it and no email rights. So I want to see a 30,000 person university and the lineup at that one Google station. In my little marketing mind, you know what that's called? The Trojan horse strategy. Get it into the university and then make the demand so strong that the librarians can't resist. Kindle singles, revitalizing poetry, short stories, the anthology disappearing. Oh, this is my 45 record, I just love 45s. Uh, Elsevier, article level, article level publishing now, so that the scholarly work can get out faster because they're getting threatened by the preprint process and open access. You're in the process of ending your television signal in New Zealand. We've already done it in Canada and the US. You know why channel two through 13 is disappearing. So you can create white band broadband, free broadband to everybody in the country. We'll be launching it over the next 12 months in Canada and the US. So once you have complete access from every one of these, you know the flip phone is dying. Sorry, five minutes. Uh, on a good day. Oh God, okay, let me go. <laughs> 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 There's the stuff. Mobility, deal with the kids and their mobile issues. 4G and this stuff will shift everything. Uh, those are the cheap phones that will be put on a credit card. They're already in the lab, already out there. The ability to go with, uh, oh, i got to skip through this, hold on. There, I can talk about this later. I'm just saying there's a difference in books. What does it mean? What do answers look like if that's your business? If you thought of your business as information and answers, does that change the way you view the programs you put in your library and your portfolio? We got WikiLeaks now. What are you going to do when 440,000 documents come out and they ask you, what do they say about New Zealand? What tools are you using? So the last point is, do you want to be a grocery store? Do people want grocery stores? Yeah. Do you want to have all the databases and books in your grocery store? Or do you want to be the menu? saying, here's a few things that match your needs. Or, do you want to be the chef and the recipe? Or do you want to be the meal? What do people really need? And what does a library look like that serves meals and empowers people with recipes? Or we can continue to be warehouses for information with people who help. So, make that transition. You can do it all, but what's, what's your lead foot? So, just lastly, okay. Here are the last ones. Focus on what's going to make you great in the future. Do the research, but keep an open mind because the stuff, the world is changing. Communicate properly. Bookmarks are not marketing. There's nothing wrong with a little prop library propaganda. We saw uh, Carol yesterday doing a wonderful job of sound bites on what libraries do that's awesome that will stick in a politician's head or a funder's head or a manager's head way better than a 40 pound report. We're trusted. Don't mess up the library brand. We are good at the trust thing because we care and because we care about people. But we need to advocate for ourselves. No one's gonna do it for us. So let's get the marketing arm together. Let's make sure we know what our value is. 
Let's make the sale, and selling is not a dirty word. There are techniques to get people to buy what you've got, and they're buying it anyway. They may not be paying money for it, but they're paying with time and prestige in their lives. They're committed to us. Let's use the teamwork we need to get ahead. Let's serve everyone. We are a bunch of Lisa Simpsons trying to serve Bart. <laughs> Lastly, you have to sit by the side of a river a very long time before a roast duck will fly into your mouth. <laughs> You can all create a future that we care about that will be better. Or commercial entities will deliver something that is not in our best interest. So pick where you want to be. Thank you. <laughs>